about it. Now another area of risk that people don't consider but need to has been identified in research like my own that has followed children to adulthood where we find that during adolescence, teenagers with ADHD are likely to start their sexual activities earlier than others, including intercourse, that they have much shorter relationships with others because of their social skill difficulties, that they are also less likely to use contraception when they engage in sexual activities with others. It's easy to predict what will happen then. There is a far higher risk for teenage pregnancy in people with ADHD, either as the father or the mother. And we know that these pregnancies carry with them a much greater risk for the mother and the baby as a result of various problems that go with adolescent pregnancies. And these pregnancies are further complicated by smoking during pregnancy, by unusually low or high body mass indexes or weight, and by the use of alcohol and other substances during pregnancy. In my own study in the city of Milwaukee that followed children with ADHD to adulthood, we found that at least 32% of the males and 68% of the females had had a teen pregnancy. Now, they did not always carry these pregnancies to term, but if they did, they were more likely to place these babies up for adoption because they simply weren't ready to be parents. Our results were confirmed in a large population study conducted in Sweden where again we found that in their general population of teenagers, teens with ADHD were five times more likely to have experienced a pregnancy as a teenager than were typical teenagers. And of course, if one is not using contraception during sexual activity, there is a higher risk for various sexually transmitted diseases. In my study, it was four times greater than that seen in typical teens and young adults. All of this suggests that by mid to late life, people with ADHD could be at greater risk for infection with the human papillovirus, and as a result, at greater risk for the various cancers that can arise from that virus, suggesting that it might be wise for us to vaccinate ADHD children and young teens against the HPV virus using the various vaccinations available to us now and before they begin their sexual careers in order to hopefully reduce this long-term risk for cancer. We have also found in research in the past decade that children and teens with ADHD, as well as young adults, engage in far more sedentary activities than do typical people of the same age. They exercise less. They read less, both for pleasure and for self-improvement. They engage in far less in-person social activities with friends and are far less likely to engage in a variety of self-improvement and health maintenance activities. Instead, these ADHD individuals spend more time watching television, spend more time interacting with screens in the technology they may have available to them, such as tablets and smartphones, besides their use of computers. We know that they are also more likely to use social media, such as texting and social media websites. And especially teenagers with ADHD are likely to engage in internet game playing with others 
And by late adolescence and adulthood, we find that about 15 to 20 percent of them qualify as having an internet addiction, which is far higher than what we see in the typical population. Now, the risk of internet addiction is predicted not only by the severity of ADHD, but also by coexisting depression, level of anxiety, and the degree of social problems that they experience, such as neglect by others, or even outright rejection by others. So it's a complex picture. But ADHD is among the most important factors in predicting such internet use and addiction. When we look at the health of ADHD individuals and we ask them about it, we hear them complaining of a variety of vague general health risks by young adulthood, much more than other adults with ADHD. Things such as general headaches, generalized fatigue, low back pain, joint pain, or other difficulties. Now, ADHD predisposes to such heightened complaints of physical problems, but it's also worsened if they have comorbid anxiety or depression. Even in children who no longer have ADHD by adulthood, we still find that they have more of such complaints than we would expect in typical people. But these risks for general, generally poor health, that is, are even worse in the cases whose ADHD persists to adulthood. Now, much research has been done demonstrating that a sizable minority of children and adults with ADHD have a variety of sleeping difficulties, including insomnia, disrupted sleep, inefficient sleep, breathing problems and sleep apnea, early rising, and next day fatigue, all of which can make their symptoms worse, particularly the symptoms of inattention. Some studies now are suggesting that females with ADHD also have a heightened risk for fibromyalgia syndrome. And we've found in some studies that 25 to 30 percent of people who complain of fibromyalgia have ADHD. This risk is further increased by the degree of impulsiveness we see in these people, but we also see it associated with higher use of opioids and abuse of those substances. Research shows that there is a shared genetic liability between ADHD and several medical disorders, such as gout and migraine headaches. What this means is that the genes that are causing ADHD, or at least increasing the risk for it, are also genes that contribute to these other medical difficulties. So not only is ADHD predisposing to medical and health problems through its effect on poor self-regulation and impulsivity, but also it is directly affecting the risk for these problems through the shared underlying genetic pathways to them. We also see this for other disorders, such as increased complaints of gastrointestinal disorders, such as dyspepsia, um, and also irritable bowel syndrome, and even constipation. Now, research well documents that ADHD increases the likelihood of substance experimentation, use, and abuse. We see this especially for substances like tobacco, marijuana, and alcohol. And lately, we have also found that there is an increased use of caffeine beverages among young adults with ADHD although that's not reliably established just yet. 
and that's the reason for the question mark next to caffeine. Several studies this past year have also shown that cocaine abuse may affect about 10% of adults with ADHD. We also see that they have more difficulties quitting the use of these substances. And if they try to quit, they're more likely to relapse back to smoking. And they also use these substances far more often than even typical people who use these substances uh, in their lives. Now, this is made much worse by the onset of conduct disorder in adolescence. Conduct disorder is a pattern of various antisocial activities, such as lying, stealing, fighting, running away from home, and so on. And if that pattern develops, then people with ADHD who also have conduct disorder have an increased use of other drugs, what we call hard drugs, such as amphetamines, illegal use of prescription drugs, opioids, heroin, and hallucinogenics, among others. So while ADHD alone increases the risk for the use of the substances at the top of this slide, the presence of conduct disorder is going to increase the likelihood of substance use disorders for other substances as well. Now, one would think that with these risks, there would be a growing risk by midlife for cancer and coronary heart disease. When we look at the eating patterns and nutritional habits of people with ADHD, we see that they are more prone to consuming fast food and foods that contain high levels of carbohydrates and sugars, both in their food and in their beverages, what we would call a Western style junk food diet. Because of this, we also find they might be more deficient in vitamin D and zinc. And where that is found to be the case, supplements for those should be added to their diet. A few studies suggest that doing so might slightly improve ADHD symptoms in children who are deficient in these vitamins and elements. People with ADHD show very impulsive eating patterns and preferences. Uh, and females in particular show a high rate of binge eating disorder or impulsive eating pathology. And we see that many more of them, indeed up to four times more, may qualify for poor impulse control while eating and especially for the eating disorder known as bulimia. All of these problems with diet lead to both an increased likelihood of dental problems, including plaque and dental caries, in addition to the risk for dental trauma that comes from their high rate of accidental injuries. They're also less likely to care for their teeth on a daily basis through good oral hygiene practices. And this, of course, increases their risk for obesity as well, that is, their eating patterns are doing so. And there is a shared genetic risk between ADHD and obesity by adulthood, in addition to the effects that impulsive eating has on this risk for obesity. It's no surprise then that we see a growing risk across the lifespan for a greater likelihood of type 2 diabetes. Indeed, teens with ADHD have more than a two and a half times greater risk for this problem. And adults with ADHD have more than a three times greater risk of having type 2 diabetes. As we look ahead, we see a growing risk for other future medical problems by midlife, including a higher risk of coronary heart disease, CHD, by age 30. Here we find that there's a growing risk for hypertension, for problems with cholesterol, for laying down atherosclerotic plaques in their arteries, 
for having a higher risk of future CHD, coronary heart disease, using the Framingham study point system by five to 10 years later. So let me explain further. We see that people with ADHD, even at a very young age in adulthood, are already beginning to show signs of high risk for future cardiovascular disease as a result of their various health problems, diet, lack of exercise, obesity, and so on. There's a growing risk for colorectal cancer in these individuals as well. Some of that is due to their diet and obesity. Other, other parts of that risk are due to their increased abuse of substances. And don't forget the risk for the HPV virus infection may be greater in these individuals, and that also would increase their risk for colorectal cancer. Indeed, you see here that the risk is more than three times greater in adulthood for such cancers than we see in other individuals. By late life, we find that older adults who have ADHD have a growing risk for developing dementia, indeed about three to four times greater risk. And they have about a two and a half times greater likelihood of developing other brain disorders that involve the basal ganglia in the central part of the brain and the cerebellum. For instance, look at the risk for Parkinson's disease. It's about eight times greater in people with a diagnosis of ADHD. And we know that Parkinson's is a disorder of the basal ganglia. By the way, one study suggested if children had been treated or adults had been treated with stimulant medication, their risk for these various brain region problems in late life was markedly higher, about eight to nine times higher. But before we rush to judgment and claim that the stimulants, the ADHD drugs, cause this increased risk, remember that more severe cases of ADHD are more likely to be treated with these medicines and are more likely to use higher doses. And so the use of ADHD medications may not be the cause of these problems, but those medications and their use is simply a marker that the individual has a more severe form of ADHD than are others who may not have been treated with the medicine. So we need more research on that issue before we can conclude that the medications might be responsible for that. Now, recent genome-wide studies, which scan the entire human genome looking at risk genes for ADHD, have found a variety of such genes. But these studies have also found that ADHD and its risk genes predispose to a variety of medical difficulties through shared genetic risk, as I've already mentioned in speaking about the risk for migraine headaches, among other difficulties.